This podcast is brought to you by the Prospect Research Institute, a vibrant online learning community providing high quality educational content, the opportunity to connect with peers, and an outlet for new ideas in the field of nonprofit fundraising research. At the end of the day, what I love is interacting and engaging with my clients. I love hearing these amazing ideas that are just so cool and so outside of the box that nobody else has thought to do. Welcome to Prospect Research Chat Bites, a podcast by and for prospect research professionals. This interview is part of the Career Curious series. I'm Jennifer Filla. Today, I'm talking with Bond Lammy, Managing Associate at Bentz Whaley Flessner. Hello, Bond. Thank you for joining me today on Chat Bites. Thanks, Jen. I am thrilled to be here. When I look over your LinkedIn profile, a few things stand out. The first is that you don't just work for nonprofits, you served on nonprofit boards. Would you be willing to share a little bit with us about how you ended up on those boards and what's it like to serve as a director or a trustee of a nonprofit? Yeah, sure. Happy to do so. I lived in Chicago for 15 years, went to school there, undergrad and grad school, and got pretty involved in the community after on my undergrad program just trying to get to know people better and and try to get a sense for what kind of stuff I was passionate about. Until my current job, I'd worked in nonprofits my entire career, so certainly was exposed to a lot of different organizations and got involved in HIV AIDS related causes when I was in college. So serving on the junior board was kind of a natural feeder. And junior boards, I think, are very interesting. Uh, We were seeing a lot of these like young professionals organizations and things like that popping up. And, you know, generally their mission is usually to be a feeder to the big board in time for folks, although, you know, it's a little early to tell at that point who's going to end up having the capacity to to serve in that way and, and make financial contributions in that way. So I would say that board was more of like a social board. Uh, it was certainly really interesting and impactful. And some of my professional relationships that I have to this day are folks that I met uh, through AIDS Foundation. I ended up being a charity runner for them in a couple of their marathons. And it was just a very personally enriching experience, but it wasn't necessarily any sort of prep or primer for being on a board itself. With Chicago Dance Crash, a good friend of mine founded that company, uh, actually when we were roommates together after college. And I support him and he was so passionate about his mission. And, And frequently we hear from our fundraisers and senior leadership at our organizations that that is a really good way of recruiting people to be on the board. It's through kind of referral and personal relationships. And I would completely agree with that. That was a much more grassroots type experience because it's a very small organization. They don't even have a database still to this day, almost 20 years in existence as as an organization. So that one was, it was interesting, is is very grassroots, very much uh, bring people to events, secure donations and support of our annual fundraiser, that kind of thing. Uh, But that was very personally enriching for me. But then I would say the advisory board for my alma mater, I'm a double alum of North Park, and that's something that's more a real passion area of mine in terms of getting, raising the profile of North Park School of Business and Nonprofit Management, which incidentally offers an entirely online degree in nonprofit management. I really am excited about, I'm on that currently, about guiding the future of that program and helping us to gain prominence and attract really passionate and committed folks who are in this industry and want to be in this industry. Essentially, it's like an MBA, but on the nonprofit side. And, and that's, that's what we're seeing in the field, right? The professionalism of the field. So, th- so that one is, I think, very personally fulfilling. And that's probably the first board or advisory board role I've been on where there was kind of a communicated giving expectation, which is what we might see as more reflective of a, of a mature fundraising operation where they say, will you join this board? Here's the term and here's how much we would expect you to, to commit financially. Oh, very interesting. So you've, you've kind of grown across your board leadership positions and now you're in a, a, a more mature professional situation. Is that the same with your networking? Has that impacted that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think the thing that's really interesting in general about our industry and I talk with Uh, my clients all the time about this is it's actually really hard to figure out how to be a philanthropist. It's, it's not something that just, you know, we think, I think sometimes in research, Oh, well, this person has this much money. This is how much we could ask them for. This is their giving capacity. 
But there's a whole other element of it, which is what tugs at my heartstrings. And then there's also the element of, well, how do I know an organization is going to make the most impact with this? And sometimes there's a case of, I actually am displeased with the direction the organization is going, but I believe in the mission and I want to stay around to help steer them in a different direction. And that's the stuff I think is really fascinating about the philanthropic world and about being involved in these advisory boards or councils or boards is we have the ability to provide our input and our feedback, not just financial support. And, you know, for better or for worse, that's what organizations get when they ask somebody to serve in a volunteer capacity. Spoken like a true female philanthropist. <laughs> you know, we, at, in general, or being, or generalizing, we tend to want to volunteer so that we can help shape and create the impact, not just give money to it. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. It's great to see. And of course, I was just really happy and glad to see you taking leadership roles in nonprofits. But then I also am dying to know what your prospect research story is. So how did you get involved in prospect research? You know, I usually tell people that I'm one of the few that actually intentionally knew I wanted to go into this profession. And we're seeing more and more of them. So that's exciting and encouraging. And, and with our help and the help of folks in the industry, we'll, we'll see even more. But when I was in my undergrad program at North Park, I was studying sociology. As I mentioned, I got involved with HIV AIDS related causes and ended up volunteering at a place called Bonaventure House, which was a transitional living facility for people with HIV AIDS. And it started where we would just go and we'd like hang out with the residents, play checkers with them sit at the front desk. And I kind of felt like I'm just killing a lot of time. I, I don't really know that I'm being helpful engaging in small talk. So I asked if there were other opportunities and they paired me up with the development team. And true to anyone's initial volunteer experience with the development department, I ended up inputting data into Razor's Edge, which I think everybody has as their story if they've ever volunteered someplace, and also helping them out with like event planning. And there was a certain amount of the stuff related to process with that that I really loved. I knew I, I always knew I wanted to be a nonprofit, but then I knew I wanted to be in development. But I was like, well, I don't want to do events. I don't want to ask for money face to face. Uh, there's something on this advancement services. And of course, I didn't know that term at the time but on that side. That's really attractive to me, but I really couldn't quite get it, figure it out. And then in my grad school program, we had a career planning class. And in that class, one of the breakout topics. They just talked about some of the other areas within development that um, might be of interest. And they mentioned prospect research and they started describing it. The dean of my grad school, Wes Lindahl, actually, he was at Northwestern before and he'd actually written a paper on analytics back in like the 80s. So he might be like the grandfather of analytics that we know of in terms of uh, applications within the world of philanthropy. And I remember him describing it and I'm just thinking, wow, I think this research thing is what I want to do. And a colleague of mine from grad school, Corey, was also in that class, and she had just gotten a job as a gift officer at Loyola University Health Systems, which is outside of Chicago. And so when they posted a position for a research analyst, she contacted me and she said, Bond, I know you said this is what you want to do. We've got this job open. So it really uh, was, a, was a pretty intentional path. And then I was certainly fortunate to kind of have the right connections at the right times to know there was an opportunity available and be able to capitalize on that. That's a beautiful story. That's amazing. You're right, because I think people can more intentionally choose this career now, it's, it has a higher profile, but it didn't always. And so many people fall into it. Well, I'm so glad that you chose our career, Prospect Research. That's wonderful. Yeah, it was kind of cool too, because that they had just spun off, the health system had just spun off from the university and everything was new. So it had a very kind of entrepreneurial perspective to it. And I actually talk when I do trainings with a researcher or something, especially if they're in a smaller shop, I say, you know, one of the benefits to the APRA community, if you're in a small shop is if it's just you, you don't really know if what you're doing is right or wrong. You have no idea. You're just kind of winging it or you're taking the lead from your fundraisers um, and trying to be as responsive as possible. 
So it was a great environment. I really enjoyed my interactions with the fundraisers and I really enjoyed being able to be so one-on-one with them. But if I hadn't been able to be involved in my local APRA community to, to learn from some other really great organizations in the Chicago area, it would have been a lot more of a challenging role for me. I'm sure. And you, the Chicago chapter, the APRA Illinois chapter, is very vibrant. They have some wonderful networking and learning opportunities. And that brings us right into the fact that you are serving on the APRA International Board right now, in addition to serving on a nonprofit advisory board. What is it like to sit on the APRA International Board and and how has APRA impacted your career? So APRA International is a fantastic organization, as are the chapters. And I think that you know, we're at the point now in our relationship between the chapters and international that, that we're able to really take a lot of great ideas and build off of them and collaborate in some really great ways. Um, and I'm just so proud. It's a significant time commitment and it's really rewarding. So <laughs> it's kind of like, a, I don't know if I want to say work hard, play hard, because I don't know that researchers are really partiers in general. <laughs> But we're able to have these really great discussions about the future of our profession, how we can best advocate for our members, for folks in their individual roles to get a seat at the leadership table. There's all sorts of questions now we're asking that we wouldn't have asked five years ago. And there's all sorts of questions that five years ago we were asking that we don't need to ask now. Um, And that's great. The, The biggest benefit to being involved as a volunteer in APRA Internationals, I think that the more involved you are, the more you know what services are available. So we do a salary survey every three years, and I use that on a regular basis uh, with clients in terms of helping them advocate for pay raises or increased titles or something like that. We've got the body of knowledge, which has these awesome interactive quizzes that you can use to help assess if your job description is in alignment with your role. We've got the ethics toolkit. We've got an advocacy toolkit. The international board is a significant responsibility. Uh, I'm the treasurer right now. I'll be president-elect in September. And as treasurer, I'm responsible for the financials of a 2,000-member organization. And that is (laughs) a bit stressful. So I think that we all know not to take our roles lightly and to be serious, to be as responsive as we can to things that are changing in our industry and to the needs of our members but also just to remind people of the services that are already out there. We have so many benefits and we're so open to idea sharing. And and that's the thing that I'm just so thankful about for the APRA community and why I'm so happy to give back. But it's definitely a lot of work. (laughs) Do you feel that you're being groomed for that? Like, have you taken steps up to become president? How how has that worked in terms of, you know, learning the ropes? You, You wouldn't want to become president all at once. So the way that our model works is you're actually on a three-year track when you're president. So you get elected into the president-elect role. You're in that for a year, then you're the president for a year, then you're the past president for a year. So there's a way to try to ensure continuity. And it's nice because there's always kind of a balance. If one person is super busy with their job, somebody else can kind of step up. And it's also nice from a historical knowledge perspective. If something was agreed on three years ago, four years ago, a board term is three years. And then if you're on the executive committee, it extends your term. So essentially, you always have at least two people that have more than three years of knowledge of how things were done. We struggle a lot less as a profession and as a board with the volunteer pipeline because we just have such enthusiastic, engaged volunteers. So if you're listening to this and you're an APRA volunteer, thank you. You are amazing. Um, And we're really, really fortunate to have that. So I would say there's definitely some level of, of grooming and preparing, and there's a pretty good onboarding process or passing roles off from one person to the next. But, you know, it's still a little terrifying. <laughs> That's great. Before I let you go, Bond, you have chosen an interesting career path, and not everyone does. So you are now working at Bentz Whaley Flesner, which is a consulting firm. And I'm kind of curious what led you there and any tips you might have for others about how to decide if that's an appropriate choice for them. Sure, absolutely. Uh, Incidentally, this is a topic that I probably get some sort of LinkedIn message about once every five to six weeks (laughs) from somebody in the industry. There's certainly a a healthy appetite out there for choosing maybe a a non-traditional or less traditional path. In, in the profession. There's a few things. When I, when I reflect back on why I made this decision, at the time before I started at BWF, 
I was the director of prospect research at University of Chicago, which is a fantastic job and a fantastic organization that I really loved. The realities at the time of our profession were that folks in our profession just didn't move. They didn't leave jobs. They would get promoted up or if they had to move for some sort of personal reason to another place, then they moved. But people weren't willing to move across the country to take a job in our profession the same way that a fundraiser is. And so my assessment was kind of in terms of any sort of vertical mobility, I can wait for whoever's above me to move. I can wait for one of five positions in the country with a larger research shop than mine to move and assess that type of opportunity. I could expand my skill set and move into prospect management, analytics, and managing a smaller team perhaps somewhere else. Or I could look at something a little bit more non-conventional like consulting. And uh, I happened to really believe in the mission of BWF and the Insight team in particular, which is the name of our prospect development and analytics practice. And it it really seemed like a place that I could see myself fitting in at. Uh, I would describe the interview process as basically doing everything to convince me not to take the job. And I'm not sure (laughs) if that's how other consulting firms work, but it's a high stress job. And a, a lot of times people think travel is fun and personal travel is very fun. Professional travel is, is maybe less fun. So there's a lot of things that need to be weighed and and considered for those of you who are thinking about doing something like this. And, you know, at the end of the day, what I love is interacting and engaging with my clients. I love hearing these amazing ideas for what places are doing that are just so cool and so outside of the box that nobody else has thought to do. I love helping people solve problems, but sometimes I help people solve the same problems again and again and again, or I help the same five organizations solve the same problem. And that stuff is a bit more challenging. So not to also actively work to unconvince people from going into consulting. I think it's probably one of the roles in our industry that has the most tendency to be romanticized. And it's a great job and there's a lot of really good rewards, but it is, it's very intense. There's a lot of pressure to do it. Some clients will treat you as a collaborative partner, much like your relationships, a lot of folks' relationships with your fundraisers, and some will treat you like you need to get this done by a certain time. So, so that type of stuff is definitely worth kind of weighing and considering in terms of moving into consulting. And then there's a lot of time where you're just by yourself and you're really responsible for managing your own time and making sure that things get done. And if you are a, a social person, ambivert or an extrovert, uh, that's something that you need to consider as well because it can be a bit of a lonely profession at times. Very sage advice. Good things to consider. And I would agree with them all. <laughs> Especially the high stress part. <laughs> right. We should start a support group. I love it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time to share with the audience today, with me. It's been wonderful to learn more about you. And I am excited to see you progress in leadership at APRA. Thank you for your service, too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jen. This was a lot of fun. That was Bon Lammy. Managing Associate at Bentz Whaley Flesner. As you heard from Bond, the field of prospect research has changed over the years and now offers more opportunities for career advancement than ever before. Get ready for success by taking advantage of the Prospect Research Institute's Research Connectors Group. Prepare for your next career opportunity with curated content and monthly online meetings with peers and by leveraging my expertise as group moderator. Find out more about the Institute's learning community at www.prospectresearchinstitute.org. I look forward to learning with you.